नमस्कार गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का पीआरएल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी हार्टी वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पीआरएल का अमृत व्याख्यान दिस इज द ट्वेल्थ व्याख्यान ऑफ द 75 एपिसोड सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान विच इज बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज एज अ पार्ट ऑफ पी आर एल ऑफ लेगेसी एंड हिस्ट्री in fundamental physics and space sciences established in the year 1947 by father of indian space program dr vikram sarabhai the prl's platinum jubilee that is prl at 75 coincides with india's 75 years of independence so it's a joint celebration of development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhya today is a special day for us that we have a very special vyakhyan karta dr m rajivan with us who is going to speak on earth system science for socio economic benefits this is a topic which is very close to everyone because it relates to the study of earth sciences and how it helps in benefiting a country and i remember very well when dr rajivan was there in uh, in isro and uh, we had a launch of uh, chandrayaan 1 in october and it was raining very heavily for a few days uh, before the launch day and uh, he made a prediction telling that uh, we can go ahead uh, with the launch of the chandrayaan 1 using the pslv in uh, on 22nd of october 2008 and uh, so he is a, is an excellent uh, uh, atmospheric scientist and a modeler and has made a significant contribution in this field which will be detailed by my colleague uh, uh, professor pallam raju so i request now professor pallam raju to introduce dr m rajiv thank you professor bharadwaj <clears throat> it's indeed a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to introduce our vyakhyan karta or the speaker for today dr madhavan nayar rajivan who obtained his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in physics uh, from madurai kamraj university and phd from university of pune uh, he joined the imd the indian meteorological department in 1985 and he was uh, primarily responsible for preparing the high spatial <coughs> resolution grid all india rainfall and temperature time series and making it publicly available while serving as the director of the national climate center in pune which is a part of imd <clears throat> he then moved to the national atmospheric research laboratory gardanki in 2008 uh, where he held the uh, where he led the numerical weather forecasting group and uh, dr rajivan then shifted to the ministry of earth sciences as advisor in 2012 and then briefly served as a director of the indian institute of tropical meteorology in pune in uh, 2015 before actually becoming the secretary of the ministry of earth sciences government of india in later in that year in december 2015 uh, dr uh, rajivan has uh, made uh, original and significant contributions to the monsoon variability and monsoon predictions uh, one which was just alluded to by uh, our director wherein a real uh, launch was uh, done based on his predictions Uh, which includes you know distinguished oper- uh, includes operational long range forecasting of monsoon seasonal rainfall climate change and uh, extreme weather events cloud radiation interaction and uh, satellite operations and aerosol radiation forcing he took a uh, major initiative and provided the leadership uh, role uh, for launching the ambitious indian deep uh, ocean mission aimed at deep ocean exploration of resources and uh, research on marine biology and uh, biodiversity which is again a very important and uh, field in india and the world this initiative definitely will uh, boost the blue economy initiatives of the government of india it was actively uh, involved in framing up the arctic and blue economy policies for india he has published more than 140 research publications uh, with a h index uh, of 50 and uh, several uh, you know citations over 
uh, for his uh, scientific contributions. He has been honored with the fellowships of all the three Indian Academy of, of India. Uh, with this uh, brief uh, introduction, I uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Rajivan to talk on the topic of uh, Earth System uh, Science for Socioeconomic Benefits. Dr. Rajivan, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Palam Raju. And, uh, and I also I should thank uh, Dr. my good friend and Dr. Anil Bhardwaj for inviting me for this important uh, event and uh, 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 giving me an opportunity to talk uh, in the 75 years celebration of uh, Physical Research Laboratory. Uh, I will uh, just uh, uh, before I start the presentation, I would like to give uh, uh, my huge respect for PRL because uh, when I was uh, my initial posting of IMD was in Ahmedabad, I was in, I was uh, in charge of weather forecasting center at IMD Pune office, uh, sorry, IMD Ahmedabad office. And I used to visit PRL every Tuesday to meet uh, Professor PR Pusharidi and uh, Professor R. N. Keshav Murthy, who was my PhD guide later. And uh, so PRL gave me everything except salary. They used to give me library facility. I can enter even on Saturday. They used to give me, they gave me an identity card. I could even enter on Saturday and go to library and even compute, even including computer facility. So PRL at that time had a very small computer facility. I think it, is, it was a wax machine. I remember I used to work with that wax machine. So thank you PRL for, uh, for my initial, for facilitating my initial years of my research. I am very thankful to PRL. I am very thankful to Dr. Anil Bhardwaj for inviting me. So next uh, 45 to 50 minutes, I'll be talking about what is the system science for social economic benefits, what are the benefits we can acquire by doing, by, by studying as well as by practicing its system science. Uh, well, how you define it, system science is very simple. It, um, and as you know that uh, it has uh, five um, spheres and it's all interactive. It's a system, it's an interactive system. It has atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, and the biosphere. And these are all spheres are not independent. They all interact with each other. That also very non-linearly. And uh, so Earth system science basically seeks a deeper understanding of the physical, chemical, biological, and human interactions that determine the past, current, and future states of the Earth. And Earth system science provides a physical basis for understanding the world in which we live and upon uh, which humankind seeks to achieve sustainability. So understanding Earth system science is very important for our sustainable uh, living. And uh, what, what kind of Earth system science services we can think of is one is weather and climate services, and uh, second is ocean and uh, coastal state services, seismological services, basically earthquake, uh, this, uh, related to the core earth, and ocean survey we can do. And uh, I, I will give you some kind of examples how uh, what kind of ocean survey we can do. And ocean technology development, which is a very, very important component of uh, system science, and exploration of marine uh, ocean living and non-living resources. There are plenty of resources available in the ocean which we need to really explore and exploit, uh, but sustainable exploitation and exploration of three polar regions. These are the main uh, system science services, which uh, um, the Ministry of Earth Science has been doing it. And I will uh, briefly mention about all the services now. The one is weather and climate service. As you know that um, IMD is the main um, uh, organization which provides weather and climate services in this country. And uh, weather, weather and climate services, basic forecasts and warnings, basically it means it's uh, now cost from, few, from for next few hours, maybe two, three hours, then short range forecast for next few days, three, four days or five days, then medium range up to 10 days, then extended range forecast from 10 days to one month, then short seasonal forecast up to one season. Then even in a beyond seasonal forecast, yeah, you can, we can talk about decadal prediction. Then, Finally, we can talk about climate change scenario. It's, it's not, we don't solve, uh, for climate change scenario, we don't talk about prediction, we say it's a projections. So climate change projections also can be both. So it is a large spectrum, uh, starting from few of, few minutes to even centuries, uh, it has a scope. And uh, uh, frankly speaking, I am India, I am uh, Ministry of Essence has been doing all this kind of, all this spectrum uh, activities we are doing it. And how you do a weather prediction, very brief, I will not go detail. Uh, we start with, uh, you need a lot of data, three-dimensional data, both atmosphere and ocean. And you, uh, and you need observations uh, 
earn every day and uh, every hour, uh, mostly every hours. And that, that goes to a kind of data simulation system. Then you need a model, mathematical model, which this data goes. And the models are uh, predictive. The models are called predictive models. The model predicts the feature state of the atmosphere as well as oceans. Then from their output, you can do the post-processing and and develop kind of a forecast products. This is the word, this is what numerical basic prediction system. And we do IMD does this every day. At um, now it is daily, it was twice in a day, now it is four times in a day. And it's it's a, it's a continuous process, 24 uh, 24 7 process. And uh, what kind of observation? We you we take make use of all kinds of observations, including surface observation. You can see the left hand side top is the surface observatories. Whatever the ocean is there, basically that's a ship observation. Our ship goes, they take observation every six hours or so. And sonde means it's basically radio zone where we send balloons and take observations. And you can see the big difference between southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere. Most of the observations are from northern hemisphere. The aircraft, when they fly, they take observations, the aircraft, and they send it to the, the nearby weather stay, weather office, Mr. Office, and they collect and, and we have a a scheme under WMO to exchange all the data. So India gets data from all over the countries, and our data also goes to all countries. If we don't have any, uh, there is no third world, fourth world, uh, south, north, north divide, nothing. Our meteorology is all, all, all are equal, and we provide uh, data with all the, we share the data with all. And in the weather prediction model, out of 100 data go, which goes into the model, 90 data, 90% of data comes from satellite. So satellite is an uh, important uh, uh, data uh, source for weather, weather and climate prediction. Without satellite, we would not have progressed so far um, about weather prediction. We have plenty of satellites. Uh, of course, in India, India, ISRO has our own satellites, and we use sat that sat sat satellites. In addition, we have uh, plenty of other satellites, for example, European Union, China. China has a satellite. Japan has a satellite. Of course, NOAA. Uh, US has plenty of uh, polar orbiting satellites. So we use make make use of all the satellites, not only Indian satellites. Indian data goes, Indian satellite data goes only 30 percent. Remaining 70 percent of satellite data comes from other satellite, uh, from uh, even even from China. We have a good agreement with all these countries. And these are the, this is the mathematical model. Very very uh, looks like very simple. Uh, we saw some few equations. Uh, one is the horizontal momentum equation. And that's nothing but uh, famous Newton's equation, F is equal to ma mass into oscillation, we, divide, we make it we divide it into three x, y, z planes. And then we have a thermodynamic equation and the mass continuity is nothing but mass is conserved. And atmosphere is basically a hydrostatic. And uh, so we use, uh, unless there is some convective system like thunderstorm, uh, atmosphere is generally a hydrostatic equilibrium. And also we have a water vapor, water vapor mass. Water vapor also is conserved. Uh, it can change from one place to another place. It can change from time to time. But if you take the whole globe and average it, the water vapor, vapor mass is conserved. And uh, so we, these are all nonlinear equations, highly nonlinear equation, and uh, partial differential equation. And we don't have analytical solution. So we solve it using so empirical methods. Uh, sorry, uh, empirical method like uh, finite difference or finite element. And most of the global models are now spherical methods, the spectral methods they use, spherical harmonics methods they use. And then for this, we need a huge computer. We have a huge computing facility now, thanks to the government. They supported us to buy a computer. And 2017 or so, 18 or so, we purchased the latest computer. And one is Pratyush, that is an IATM, another is in Mihir, that's an similar level. So we put together. Uh, all this computer, and we had a whole computer put together. We have almost a 10 beta of it's one of the best uh, facilities uh, any 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 nation may have for weather and climate prediction. I think we have the fourth uh, ranking in the all the uh, after US, uh, UK, and Japan. We have the fourth uh, best uh, computing facility for weather and climate uh, services. And uh, my ministry will be soon buying the next uh, level of uh, computer. And we have a, a series of models, and um, starting from a model of uh, three, 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 330 meter resolution for that's exclusively used for Delhi fog events. And now fog season is coming up, and uh, this model will be used to predict fog. And there's a 400 meter Delhi air pollution prediction model. And from, from there, global models are at present it's 12 kilometer for short to medium range forecast. Whereas in the seasonal forecast, it is about 32 kilometers or so. So we have one of probably the one of the best forecasting system in the world. 
uh, best forecast. So we have two versions. One is based on the UK Meta Office uh, models. Another is uh, based on the US Weather Service Weather Agency. You know, it's called uh, NSUB uh, models. And um, uh, NSUB models are run by ATM, IMD, and uh, ATM. And uh, UK Meta Office models are run at NSUB. And uh, so, and we also launched. As we know, that monsoon is our bread and butter. And so we need to really improve the monsoon prediction. So we 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 have uh, launched a program called Monsoon Mission 2012. And first uh, uh, phase was up to 2017, and then we had a second phase up to 2021. And this year, MOS will launch the third phase of uh, Monsoon Mission. And it's a very very ambitious and it's a very productive mission. And it has produced a lot of good results. And only because of Monsoon Mission, we could establish all these forecasting models and forecasting systems for the country. And we had uh, uh, the advantage of this uh, mission was that we had a provision of collaborating with international players, um, especially with uh, major centers like UK Met Office, NSAP, and uh, Japan Met, Met Agency, and also many important academic institutions, universities, etc. And we have funded them for the first time. Ministry of Science has started funding uh, outside people, people from outside, loads of rupees we have spent. Uh, and we have got a lot of benefits. We have sent our people for training. And uh, so Monsoon Mission is a very ambitious, but it was very, very useful uh, mission. And uh, so over the years, as all of you know, that weather forecasts have improved. This is one a good example. This is nothing but root mean square error of wind speed at 850, 851.5 kilometer of, uh, for the Indian region. If you really see, initially the error used to be 6.5 meter per second. RMSC. Now it has gone to 4.5 years. So, so much substantial improvement, especially last few years, you can see that uh, the, the, the level in which the uh, root mean sea square area is decreasing. I mean, skill is improving uh, over the years. This is also another example when we moved from uh, a model of about 80 kilometer, uh, sorry, 30, 35 kilometer to 12 kilometer model. And a substantial improvement of uh, forecast, weather forecast we could achieve. For example, earlier we used to have the skill for, for example, a skill of three day forecast. Now the same skill we have for five day forecast. So that means that with the same skill, so three day forecast skill is much more now. And, uh, and that same skill we can have it now for five day forecast. So two days uh, of advantage we could get by improving these models. And of course, this, this, this initiative should, should go on. And this is a continuous process. We should have improving model, we should have more data, more as assimilation, etc. And weather services, IMD's main um, AJ, uh, main uh, user is uh, agriculture, uh, farmers. Uh, farmers make use of IMD's weather forecast and services. We, uh, they have an agro-meteorological services. They provide weather forecast and services, sorry, warnings to a fisherman for uh, uh, twice in a week for next for forecast with five days, the next five days. And uh, now they give to almost 42 million farmers uh, twice in a week using uh, telephone, sorry, yes, a mobile SMS, and also through uh, many other channels like websites uh, uh, and also other social media, and also some through agents, some NGOs, uh, for some Reliance Foundation, Swami Northern Foundation, etc. So we, we try to reach more and more farmers for giving weather forecasts. And there are a lot of success stories. Of course, there are a lot of bad stories. Other people are not very happy also. But at the same time, we are trying to address their issues and we are trying to improve this. Earlier, our forecast used to be only for districts. Now, uh, district, you know, that means one, one same forecast for the whole district. Our farmers won't be very happy because within one district itself, there could be a lot of variation in the weather uh, in terms of the rainfall as well as temperature. It may not be temperature, but definitely rainfall. So the, then we are now giving block level forecast. There are about 6,500 blocks in this country. One district may have about eight to 10 blocks. So we are give, now we are we started giving block level forecast for which we need higher, very high resolution models uh, that we have now. And uh, now we, as I said, we have 12 kilometer model, which we will be improving to five kilometer uh, by this year. Also. And also so tropical cyclone forecast, um, uh, forecast for flood warnings, and many other advantages. And now we started giving uh, finding new uses for some energy sector. As all of us know that government is spending a lot of money on solar and wind energy. And uh, you may not be knowing it is easy to say that solar energy, where they just take up the mills, um, uh, the yards are, and they, they are generating a lot of uh, energy. But they have a lot of problems. They need forecasts and uh, 
uh, forecast the information for next uh, 24 hours every 15 minutes. What would be the possible solar radiation level? And what would be for wind, wind, wind mills, what, be, what will be the wind speed at about 100 meters? 100 meters is the normally the, the, the height at which the wind mills, the blades rotate. And so this kind of and it's a tough terrain, you know, the buildings are kept in the hilly, so hilly regions, etc. So giving such kind of forecast every 15 minutes for next 24 to 40 hours is a very tough problem. And uh, we are trying to help them and uh, this, uh, massive investment is being made in the ministry for energy sector. And uh, so tropical cyclone forecast, I need not emphasize, yeah, it's a very, very well known uh, information that our tropical cyclone forecast has improved substantially and the whole world is recognizing now India probably India has the best forecasting uh, capability for tropical cyclones for the last uh, eight seven eight years if you take a uh, plenty of uh, good forecast and uh, our organization like WMO etc is openly acknowledging India's efforts in tropical cyclone forecast. Earlier we used to have uh, casualties of 10,000 20,000 people dying and now it is less than 100, sometimes even less than 10 people are dying. And uh, so we had improved a lot. And um, uh, of course, uh, I will not give full credit to IMD. Of course, the uh, uh, IMD is main responsibility to give forecasts and they are giving accurate forecasts. Of course, they have to be uh, appreciated and they have to be acknowledged. But in addition to that, there are a lot of other people who are working with along with the IMD to help people to some evacuation of people like uh, disaster management people, state government, there are plenty of, it's a big teamwork. And IMD is a part of the teamwork. And also, as you know, that extreme weather events are increasing, so we need to really provide information about extreme weather. As a general uh, um, uh, weather forecaster, I would like to inform you that uh, a forecast for tomorrow, whether it will rain or not, after two days it will rain or not, is a much easier job for a weather forecast. But how much it will, whether it will be an extreme rain, whether it will be very heavy rain, or whether it will be an extreme rain, or whether it will be extreme temperature for after five days or so, it, will be, it is a very tough job. So we uh, now we provide this kind of guidance in terms of probability. We may not say, um, uh, for some Ahmedabad, after five days, there will be a rain of 25 centimeters. We may not say. So what we may say that after uh, in Ahmedabad, after three, four days, there is a high probability of uh, heavy rain of uh, exceeding maybe 20 centimeters. But we may not exactly tell 25 or 30, but we may say a kind of probability. But these probability forecasts are very useful and people are extensively using it now. I'm, I'm just taking an example of uh, rainfall, but it could be any parameter. Rainfall, temperature, uh, wind speed, and snowfall, for example. So this is the extreme weather guidance which IMD is now providing. And thanks to the efforts by uh, NCMRWF as well as IATM, IATM made, made a lot of efforts for developing this extreme weather guidance. And we have a, a system called Ensemble Forecasting System in which we generate not only one forecast, we generate a suit of forecast. From there, you can calculate probabilities. And also in Delhi, you know, people who live in Delhi, I lived in Delhi last five and a half years or so, but um, uh, in the winter, we always have this air, air quality problem. So government has asked us, the prime minister office has asked about two years back, uh, two and a half years or two and a half years back that IMD, sorry, MOE should develop a, a air quality forecasting system, prediction system for such events. And IATM was, came forward and uh, they have uh, collaborated with an organization called NGAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the US, which is supposed to be the best in the, for atmospheric science. And uh, they have collaborated and they have developed a huge, uh, and highly advanced air quality forecasting system. Now it is done in Delhi and neighborhood, and they'll be soon expanding to other cities, and for which they have established uh, observation systems also over here in Delhi. And uh, we also don't know why we do all these things. We also need to understand what is the benefits of doing all these things. We make a lot of investment. Government is, thanks to government, they are giving a lot of money to the uh, Ministry of Health Sciences, and we are spending it. So what is the benefit? Of course, we know that from tropical cyclone, we are saving people for which we cannot, we cannot put a value. So we cannot say one, one life is equal to five lakh. We cannot put, but we are saving lives that people know, but what additional, uh, whether we have any benefit, made any big economic benefits. So that such kind of reviews we generally make, uh, periodic, periodic reviews we make. One such review was made a couple of, uh, maybe last year it was made. And uh, this is the you know, assessment that, assessment that we launched monsoon mission. And also along with the Mersun mission project, we bought a computer. So we invested almost 1,000 crore 
uh, not exactly 1,000 crore, it is much less. 1,000 crore was the whole project, but it was much less actual expenses. And we want to know how much was the economic benefits. And this was primarily meant for fishermen, uh, especially for uh, giving warnings to them, and also for uh, farmers, agriculture. So uh, we made an assessment, and we found that for they, 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 they targeted only the people who are living below poverty line. They identified few districts, 173 districts, and 10.7 billion people in agriculture and 0.53 million uh, uh, BPL fishermen. And uh, they found that over the last five years or so, they accumulated that the benefit was almost 50,000 crore. And our um, expenses were 1,000 crore, so almost 50 fold uh, increase in economic benefits. So that is the kind of economic benefits which we can achieve in doing good health care systems and services. So, which we informed the government that you give us more money, people will get more money. So, and uh, this message has been sent to government. The government is aware about the economic benefits of a system spend. And also, now we are moving in um, um, this. I'm talking about weather. Now, the moving to climate uh, time scale, we need to also understand what is what is happening in, in terms of climate, climate change. We are talking about climate change. We are talking about extreme weather events, climate modeling. And uh, this year, the Nobel Prize was won by a climate scientist, Professor Manabe. It was a big uh, boost for all climate scientists like me. And uh, because climate scientist science was not well, well acknowledged and recognized and appreciated among all the science, uh, science subjects. But I'm very sure that now uh, climate scientists also will get more recognition thanks to the Nobel Committee. And now, so, so we also making a lot of efforts in uh, developing climate system model, air system models we call. And this is this is the S system looks like. S system is nothing but as I said that it has all five spheres, and all five spheres interact each other. And they they and, and when you really develop a system model, all these components should be involved in this model. So the basic equations which we solve is the same as mathematical model equations are same as the weather prediction models, but it has much more physics and uh, in a system model. And it's a coupled system. It has an ocean. It has an uh, biosphere, it has a biogeochemistry in the ocean, and you have an aerosols, much more complicated. What exactly a system work? The same thing you should really simulate in the model. So such model was developed recently by IATM scientists. It's a center for, center for climate change research led by Dr. R. Krishna. And they have developed a kind of, a, I, I won't say it's the best model, but definitely a, for a first, first version, it's a really excellent model. And this, of course, they will uh, keep on improving this model. And this model has participated in the IPCC climate change assessment, which was recently launched and which was recently released. This is the first time that Indian air system model participated in the climate change assessment report. Otherwise, when we uh, climate change assessment report is issued, released, immediately people say, oh, these are all based on the models, based on some US model, Europe model. They may not understand what Indians are doing. But this is the first time where the Indian model has gone into the Assessment report. So, uh, so that, that kind of experiments we are doing it. This is a one example. The right hand side figure shows the top one is observations of uh, rainfall and wind, and the bottom one is the, how the model is reproduced. Beautiful, uh, beautiful reproduction of uh, the basic ingredients of the climate system. And uh, we also uh, um, came out with a climate change assessment report recently before the IPCC report came. And uh, uh, it was led by Dr. Krishna again, and uh, the assessment and climate change report was a very beautiful assessment report, which was well recognized and appreciated by the whole country, uh, including the government. And this report is available free of cost. I ensure that that you should not you should not charge for this report. It should be freely available. So we spend money for making this book, but it, the book is available free of cost to anyone. And this is the um, uh, projection. They made a lot of projections. This one uh, projection is left hand side is the temperature. We have three, four different scenario in which we can make the projection of climate. One is RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5 or so, so. So if you take 4.5 is reasonable uh, projection. And if you take 4.5 by 2022, 20 2100, 20 20 we can expect an increase in temperature about 2.5 degrees or so. Uh, about 2.5 degree or so. So uh, that is the level of uh, temperature increase. Whereas monsoon rainfall is concerned, we are happy. We are uh, monsoon is within a robust system. Uh, monsoon rainfall is going to be little increasing, not decreasing. So quantum of rainfall. Of course, in, 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 within the season there could be a lot of changes that I am not going to 
um, inform you as so they tell you now. And also we have been doing a lot of experiments like cloud seeding experiments to so people want to know, uh, especially when a drought occurs in Delhi, people, state governments start uh, doing this kind of artificial rain making, whether it, you can really produce rain from clouds uh, without any uh, 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 suitable environment. So we have done the two years experiments we are doing somewhere in Sholapur, and we are now coming out, uh, IATM will be coming out with a white paper and saying that what, what is the success rate of this uh, cloud seeding? What could be the best way of doing it? We spent almost 200 crore for doing this experiment. And I was told that this is one of the best experiments ever done in any, any part of the world for doing, understanding the artificial rainmaking process. I'll move on to ocean. Ocean also, the, the same way, ocean also has huge uh, um, uh, capability and potential for helping people. And uh, this is the ocean observation information at basic services. This is mainly catered by our institute in Hyderabad called Ingois. And they provide a lot of services, first is ecosystem related services like the potential fisheries or not baseries, oral reefs, uh, harmful, alg uh, harmful alg algae booms, ocean state forecasts, especially for Navy and coastal guards, disaster related activities, including for summer tsunami, and geospatial services, data related services, and contribution to weather and climate. And climate, we cannot talk without ocean and the capacity building. This kind of large scale activity and the, the uses of fishing community, coastal states, uh, Navy, um, uh, NHO, Coast Guard, ports, harbors, offshore shipping, uh, and of course, such institution. And that, uh, so like our oh, atmospheric observation, which IMD does it, oh, Inquis and uh, NIOT also do a lot of ocean observation. They install a lot of ocean observation. But compared to, to atmospheric observation, ocean observations are, first of all, it's a very costly instrument. And number two is very difficult to maintain because uh, land you can easily go there and repair. But oceans, if you put it in ocean, there could be a lot of difficulties and uh, handling the ocean observations are very, very tough job. But still we are doing a good job and we have a suit of observa observations uh, uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. And uh, of course, all countries contribute at the some US, they put observations everywhere. And India, normally we can find only over the Indian region. And these observations are very useful. It has it can be used for including in the model weather prediction, weather and climate prediction model that's being used now, and can be used for many understanding many ocean physical process, marine boundary layer process, biogeochemical processes, and uh, can be used for understanding uh, sorry prediction of tsunamis and coastal uh, sorry ocean state etc. And these are a suit of observation of uh, different kinds of instruments. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether you are aware about all these kind of instruments. It starts with a simple automatic weather station in a ship. We can put it AWS in a ship. Uh, in two instruments like flux mooring. This is the second panel. I mean, flux mooring is very, very complicated, but uh, very costly. So it cost about 10 crore or so. But for the first time, a few, a couple of years back, we bought this flux mooring from US. And no company, if commercial company makes this, but we could get it through a matey. And uh, this is the first time we took a, almost one year observations over Bay of Bengal. Well, now it is being shifted to Arabian Sea. Such kind of very sophisticated instruments are being used to understand the ocean processes. And these observations are very, very useful. And uh, we um, recently, Invoice has come out with a digital ocean. What are the observations they had? And they have been accumulating these observations for over the years, for plenty of years now. So they put everything put it in a digital format and you can uh, go through it it's free of course you can go to the website and uh, feel the what is what kind of data you can plot the you can make the graphics you can plot the graphs you can plot line diagrams etc to understand how the ocean state is changing but with, now the system is only within the indian region but now slowly they will move on to the whole global ocean and ocean model, like the atmospheric model, weather, weather and climate models, uh, they also, so weather and weather model, the prediction model, they also do ocean model. They also do, um, involve, they also get uh, plenty of uh, suit of, uh, very suit of uh, ocean uh, models of different categories, starting from very high resolution to coarse resolution model for different applications. And it is, this activity is mainly done by uh, invoice, but there are people working in IATM and institutes like IAC Bangalore, etc. But uh, the most of these modeling activities now done at IOI. And uh, they have a suit of uh, models and they are, these models are being used for understanding tsunamis, understanding uh, ocean state, for example, how much is the 
ocean waves, how much is the storm set when tropical cyclone comes, etc. And uh, one of the most important activities which uh, our services are help, which I am sorry, invoice is providing is the portal issue fishing zone advisory services, very important services. And uh, when fishermen goes to see, they don't know where the maximum fish is available. So then once you go there, you can have a maximum number of uh, maximum catch and they can bring and they can have a more uh, profit. So, uh, so invoice provide this kind of services through different uh, uh, different uh, stations spread over the whole Indian coast, both the east and west coast. And uh, and they use make use of mainly two observations only uh, sea surface temperature, the ocean should be cool, the temperature should be cool, colder temperature, and also there should be a lot of uh, chlorophyll, uh, a lot of greenery. Uh, so these two are the more important. And of course, they use many other important parameters like eddies, rings, windows, upwelling, thermal fronts, etc. So they use all this information and provide them a kind of advanced information that, for example, a fisherman from Madras, Chennai, they want to go. They will advise that you go to northwest direction, about 100 kilometers, you can get a lot of fish. And um, uh, such kind of, so these are all, these are also given in all regional language, um, Tamil or Malayalam, whatever language or regional language they have. So it's all translated into regional language. They provide this information. They, and we found that these are very, very useful information. And fishermen get a lot of advantage of this. They can say they can get maximum cage, and instead of uh, traveling here and there and burning their fuel, uh, diesel and all in the boat, and when going to a particular place where fish is more fish is available, they can have more fish catch. This is this is going. They are going to improve further, and um, I'm very sure that this product will be much more useful in the coming years. And also the tuna fish, tuna is a, a kind of fish which, of course. My younger days, I used to eat a lot of tuna, tuna fish, and they, they have a lot of tuna fish and British service. It's a new product, and they're still further improving it. It's also a very useful product which uh, Ingois is preparing. And ocean state forecast. Ocean state forecasts are very useful because many people are playing in the ocean, uh, ships, boats, and there's a lot of activities in the ocean. So people need to really know what kind of weather, uh, so what kind of uh, weather systems are there, what kind of ocean state is there, how much is the wave, what is the height of wave, and what kind of weather, weather systems are approaching, the cyclones are approaching, etc. So they have different kinds of uh, forecast, high, for example, high wave alert, surface current, regional wave forecast, and the sea surface height, tide predictions, global wave forecast, wave steep, and so many, so many, so many products they make. So all using observations as well as the models. And these are all shared with the different user sectors, uh, including um, uh, Indian Navy, Coast Guard, etc. And uh, these are also very, this is freely available. It's all, everybody can uh, get this uh, forecast. And they don't charge for anything. And the tsunami warning, of course, tsunami warning is uh, well known. After the 2004 tsunami, the, the great tsunami, uh, um, at that it was Department of Ocean Development. They set up this uh, tsunami warning system at Ingois, and they're, they're they keep on improving the tsunami warning system. They use observation, then they use very high resolution models to generate tsunami warnings and alerts, and they give it to people in real time. And um, and this has been doing excellent job. And um, uh, and it's one of the best uh, product which of uh, Ministry of Census. And it has Ministry of Census got a lot of good name for because of tsunami warnings. And uh, the most advantage of uh, the tsunami warning system is it is well recognized not only by Indian uh, government, but it's all recognized for the whole uh, world. Uh, so uh, Indian uh, International Oceanographic Commission, it's called IOC, it's of UNESCO, and they have requested uh, in, uh, employees to provide the services, not only for India, but the whole South Asian, uh, many countries. So it's a regional um, uh, tsunami warning uh, provider. Uh, Invoice is now regional tsunami warning provider. They provide a lot of warnings, all these warnings to different countries also. And if you really see the performance, is, uh, for example, from 2007 to 2020, about 630 earthquakes have occurred of more than 6.5. And uh, uh, our target, if you really see the target, for example, elapsed time is 10 minutes is the target. But global average is about 10 minutes, but we do it at 7.7 minutes. And uh, probability of detection, of course, is 100%. And accuracy of a hypocentral location, where the basically, basically this earthquake has happened. Uh, within 30 kilometers is a target, but uh, global achievement is for 16.5, whereas our achievement is 14.8. Like that, it's one of the best uh, sorry, tsunami warning system in the world now. 
and we should be all proud of our uh, investments and training and our people. We should congratulate the people who are okay. And also a very important point, uh, Mr. Ramayana says, uh, we never made a false alarm. So false alarm also is very, very important. If you go on telling people there is going to be a tsunami and nothing happens, it's really a uh, tragedy. And people will uh, start preparing for evacuation and nothing comes. And uh, so uh, Invoice has a very big track record of giving no false alarm so far. So it's a very big record, and we should really be very proud of them. And another important activity is the coastal. Coastal, you know, as you know that coastal, you know, many people, many major cities are in the coast, Bombay, Chennai, uh, Vishap, Vietnam, Kochi. There are many cities um, in the coastal area. And they also need a lot of services in terms of coastal services. And one is, of course, seawater quality. And uh, so this kind of observations, um, uh, this is a center called National Center for Coastal Research in Chennai. And that people, those people are doing a lot of work on understanding water quality of seawater at different places. They set up many, many, you can see the locations where they take observations. And these observations are being taken at, uh, well, uh, taken for many years now, almost 20, 20, 25 years, more than 25 years, data are available. And they, they are document what is the level of uh, um, um, changes occurring in the seawater quality. And it is being shared, and this data also shared with uh, I mean, they have environment for us to understand, and they, they put the stick, uh, yard stick for the air quality assessment. And these are the kind of instruments they launch, and there are already two uh, two operational boys are uh, kept on this in Chennai and another is uh, the city. So they are planning about nine to ten uh, such boys in the. It's a very costly instrument, uh, so uh, they will be taking a lot of observation, temperature, uh, water quality sensors, and oceanographic sensors. I, I'll tell you this, all this data are free, everybody can use this data, and uh, it's the most advantage uh, of this uh, system. And another important activity, coral bleaching, as in the coral is uh, very important in biodiversity, marine biodiversity, and we all know that because of temperature, coral bleaching is happening. And uh, so we do a lot of experiments, and we also do a lot of observations of, especially over Gulf of Manor. And uh, people, there are people in ministry who can dive into uh, these places and see physically what is really happening. And also they use uh, photographs, uh, uh, see what under underwater photographs, cameras to understand this coral bleaching, and also document properly. And um, now they have acquired some land over near to Gulf of Manar, which the Manar government has given. They'll be setting up a big facility there to understand this kind of uh, process. Another is sea level rise. Sea level rise, as you know, that global warming is happening. So ocean is uh, warming, and so um, uh, ocean is nothing but a fluid, so it can expand because of temperature is as well as a fluid can expand because of temperature is increasing. Thermal expansion have happened. Of course, there are many other uh, reasons for sea level rise. Uh, well, most important is uh, thermal uh, expansion, and this is an, uh, uh, we, uh, this is a kind of a cartoon which shows the low tide, how the uh, Bombay uh, uh, important monument works like this and high tide what will happen in the water and high tide alert what will happen uh, with a, a lot of waves can happen in the future scenario what, what will be the size of what will be the, the, the status of this monument and uh, future scenario we expect uh, the, a lot of sea level rise is going to happen plus tide high tide then we can expect this kind of situation so we need to really understand how the sea level rise is increasing and it can change, make the shoreline changes it can uh, really make the oceans and uh, so NCCR has made a lot of observations and understanding using satellite observation as well as ground observation to understand how the shoreline are changing how the shoreline is changing they documented very well and they found that um, indian whole indian mainland coast about 33 percentage is sea, sea, sea erosion coastal erosion is happening and um, about 29 percent accretion and uh, stable is about 18 percent. The one third of Indian coast is uh, vulnerable for sea coast erosion, sorry, coastal erosion, and that is very high um, number. And uh, there are a lot of effects which I will explain to you very quickly. And uh, another important thing is coastal flooding. You may be knowing about 2015 of coastal flooding in uh, Chennai. The whole um, Chennai city was submerged with water, and uh, maybe a thousand people died. And uh, so afterwards, we set up a kind of a coastal flood warning system for Chennai uh, with the help from other institutes like IIT Bombay uh, and, uh, and many other institutions. And a uh, similar system was established uh, two years back in Chennai, Bombay. 
Uh, last year, for the last year, the, we uh, really see, saw the performance of this system, which is doing well. Of course, our weather forecast, has, uh, the rainfall forecast has to improve, but otherwise, the system works very well. And uh, thanks to the Mumbai Municipal Corporation, they cooperated, like anything, they gave a lot of data, they helped us to understand the systems. And there are small, small ponds, small, small rivers are there in the Mumbai city. So we need to really understand the bathymetry of these rivers and ponds. And so they helped us to understand. So we have set up a huge end-to-end -end system of uh, flood warning for Mumbai. So coastal park, coastal flooding, and which we will be repeating it for other coastal cities. So this is a very useful product uh, and uh, to inform people in Bombay, cities like Bombay. Uh, so I, I was talking about the sea level rise. You can see that there are two good extra ex examples of Puducherry. I don't know how many people have gone to Puducherry. And if you really see the one fine morning, the whole uh, beach of Puducherry has disappeared, uh, mainly because of the coastal erosion. And also there are many other reasons. A lot of tropical cyclones start coming there and many, many other factors. And uh, NCCR, has, uh, with the help from NAOT, NAOT and NCCR put together, they put, work together. And they have done an excellent job of restoring that beach at Puducherry. They also did a similar effort for a place in Tamil Nadu, northern parts of Tamil Nadu. So these are the very useful uh, products. So this is a useful technology development for restoring beaches. So they did a lot of numerical simulations to understand why this erosion is, why the seawater is coming inside. Then they they considered they made a kind of a technology technology development of making a bed of very high large size and putting immerse, immersing into the water so that this water sea level water sea level rise is not happening over the linear. And um, um, and people are people in the city is very happy. Uh, they are able to go to beach and stay there the evenings and enjoy their life. So this is a good example how the technology can be used to understand the sea, sea uh, coastal erosion and also to restore the beaches, etc. This is the how the uh, before and after in the Puducherry beach. And another, I will come out uh, ocean resources and uh, uh, ocean survey and ocean technology. And uh, as you know, that ocean also provides a lot of uh, resources. One is energy, energy from waves, ocean currents, and uh, but unfortunately, large amount of energy cannot be created from ocean waves and less ocean currents from the Indian Ocean. But there's a huge potential for from ocean thermal gradient, which uh, I will describe you later. And ocean thermal gradient is also is is a good source of energy from which we can produce energy, uh, electricity and also it can be used for understand, sorry, developing desalination plants. And uh, India is part of the International Energy Agency Ocean Energy Systems Forum. And we have been doing a lot of work on ocean energy. And, um, and also ocean has a lot of living resources, non-living resources. If you really go in the bottom of the ocean, there are a lot of minerals available. And uh, we have a contract with the uh, organization called International Seabed Authority. And uh, this is the location where this uh, Indian uh, location in the south of India is a location where uh, 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 these minerals are available. It's called polymetallic nodules. And uh, we have a contract. And uh, this uh, this uh, in the International Seabed Authority has given about 75,000 square kilometer to India for exploration. At present, uh, there are no roads to exploit it. So we have done ex extensive work on exploring the polymetallic nodules, and we could locate uh, some nodules, and we could also understand the economic benefits of this. Uh, this thing. And uh, our understanding is if we really take the whole um, uh, polymetallic nodule available in the 75,000 square kilometer and process it, and we, we could get about $110 billion. So the huge potential of mineral. Unfortunately, we don't have any provisions for doing that now. Still, exploration work is going on everywhere. And people are working on uh, uh, defining the laws and rules and regulations, etc. So, so, so main, basically, it will, we can produce manganese, cobalt, nickel, and copper. These are the two, three, uh, four uh, metals available. The polymetric. And uh, India is, is, a, is, is a very leading uh, country where they have done last 20, 25, 30 years and extensive work on this polymetallic. So India is a pioneer for doing this kind of work. Another is a hydrothermal sulfide. This is nothing but a small volcano chimneys in the oceanic ridge available. So they also, these chimneys also oceanic ridges uh, in the Indian Ocean. So this, this, this oceanic ridges also produce a lot of uh, minerals um, from hydrothermal sulfide. And this is also another area where we can, uh, we can explore the 
ocean uh, sorry minerals and we can produce a lot of money and uh, so for this also we have now contract we recently we got it to 17 or so we signed a uh, agreement with the uh, international sea authority for exploring hydrothermal sulfide we got about 10,000 square kilometer or so for that and and this is of course this exploration is much more difficult because these chimneys volcano chimneys are of temperature about 400 celsius or so so it's a high hot zone a very hot area so going there near to them and it's around 5000 to 6000 meter below the surface of the ocean so even polymeric nodules are also in the deep sea so say so there's a lot of technological challenges going there and also developing technology some level polymeric nodules really want to explore exploit it make a really deep sea mining then we need to develop the deep sea mining system which can go up to 5 kilometer 5.5 kilometer take it out and you cannot take it out as it one kilo two kilo it's in the, it should be turned ten times and bring it to the ship and then take it to indian land and then we'll do the processing etc it's a herculean job but it's, it's it's a huge opportunity so we all should work and mos is really in it this job is mainly done at NAOT and hydrothermal sulfide exploration is mainly done by ncpo or goa in um, collaboration with other institutes uh, institute like national institute of oceanography and NAO goa also is very much involved in both in polymer nodules as well as hydrothermal sulfide and these are the different uh, technology development already which we made uh, when you just made some example they have made a remotely operating vehicle which, which can literally go up to 6000 meter and take uh, measurements etc they have done a soil tester they have launched a mining system they, and they are already tested about 5 kilometer or so so uh, in the in the technology development also we have advanced a lot and uh, there's a lot of plenty of opportunities and we need to do a lot of more work in the future which I will display. These are some of the vehicles, um, some of the instruments which they have launched: a deep ocean, a deep water ROV, deep sea inside to soil tester, a shallow water ROVs, and deep water pouring system. And basically, basically used for uh, uh, basically used for drilling. An autonomous water underwater vehicle, which of course we not developed it, but we have procured on recently. Uh, hopefully, it has come to an AOT and they will be working on that. And uh, last two items, which I will uh, display a little later. And another is uh, um, uh, desalination. As you know, that Lakshadweep Island, for example, they don't have water, drinking water. The rainwater, they cannot uh, store it for a long time, and it's not sufficient for the people to drink. And there's no, you cannot uh, make, uh, make uh, for example, wells in the, because if you drill a little uh, one meter or two, two meters, it's all sea water, it's uh, salty water. So they cannot, so they need drinking water. So NAOT has come out at that time the Department of Ocean Development has come out with a new technology for developing desalination plants. It's um, based on the temperature difference between the ocean surface and the uh, temperature at the particular depth of the ocean. And uh, so this is indigenous uh, development and highly acclaimed uh, technology development, highly appreciated, and it's a green technology. You don't, uh, unless uh, uh, reverse osmosis technique, RO technique, where you use filters which are are environmentally not friendly here nothing yeah, no no waste and only the initial investment is to be made then it can be free of cost it can be simply you can generate so such a three plants were done about many years back three plants and now recently after in the mos last two years we have started now six more plants and one plan already is completed and five more plants will come it's of course this is funded by ministry of uh, home affairs for electricity violence so one uh, one plan cost about 25 or so 2025 20 crore and uh, you can generate almost 1.5 lakh water, drinking a liter water every day and you don't need any maintenance the people the local people can operate this and run the mills and um, also there's a lot of offshore energy especially in the coastal uh, Tamil Nadu coast as well as the North Coast which also uh, Ministry of Science is helping the government to explore now Ministry of uh, non-renewable energy is coming up with a proposal of exploring exploring and also exploiting the offshore wind energy so so these are the two areas where we can really generate a lot of uh, wind energy and ocean floor mapping this is also very important we should know what is really inside the inside the sea floor uh, what kind of minerals what kind of resources what how it will look like there are, there are a lot of applications and uh, so the british institutes uh, have been doing this work for last many years almost 93 percent of 
uh, our E is at exclusively economic zone has been already done. Um, uh, another seven percentage will be completed in a few years. Last five years, about 23 percentage was covered. So I'm happy that this, this work is going extremely well. Another, another, maybe another few months, the remaining seven percentage of solution, sorry, uh, cement uh, topography maps will be prepared. I don't see this done. The data can be shared. Of course, uh, uh, we need to really take the approval of Logan because it's all, it's all uh, outside our uh, intent territory. And so we need to really be careful. Another is the uh, uh, concept of continental shell. You know that uh, when uh, India, India has uh, um, uh, India's land slopes into the oceans. And there is a, after beyond ESET also, there is a provision for acquiring this, uh, uh, the, the permission or uh, the status for acquiring this land. And for many purposes, you can, of course, you can acquire this land and you can explore there what are the minerals available, what kind of resources available. So this concept is the called continental shelf. So, and uh, India has been doing a lot of work on understanding this continental shelf. So for this, you need a lot of seismological observations, huge observations they need. So they have been doing these observations for many years. So they identified two areas. One is over uh, Bay of Bengal, another is over uh, Arabian Sea. It's almost like uh, getting a new uh, real estate. And uh, put together uh, these two areas, if we really get the claim, if our claim is accepted, and there is a commission for commission for continental shelf in uh, UN, and they are helping the commission on the limits of continental shelf, CLCS, and they have to approve it. And uh, we are already made the sort of claim submission to them. And I, I remember I attended the first meeting with them, and the meetings will be going on now. And uh, so uh, two areas, one in Arabian Sea in uh, Bay of Bengal, put together is about 0.6 million square kilometer, equivalent to the total area of Maharashtra plus Madhya Pradesh. It's basically acquiring land under the seawater, and uh, it has a lot of implications. And it's a tough process, and, and it's not very easy to simply go and uh, submit, the, uh, submit the claim. You need to really show the data, actual data. And you have to prove that this condition belongs to you. It has come from Indian uh, mainland. So you need to really understand the sediments, uh, take the observations of sediment, and prove that it has come from Indian mainland. So this is a huge work which India is doing. And another is the International Ocean Discovery Program. It's an international program. India is participating. And um, uh, there are a lot of huge uh, advances we have acquired for some understanding, monsoon process, et cetera, for Arabian, from Arabian Sea samples. And Deep Ocean Mission is a new program, new mission, which we launched recently and a few, years, a few months back. I was very happy that this mission was launched when I was secretary. I have pushed a lot and all. All, Indian, all, all scientists from MOES has helped us to develop this kind of proposal and got it approved. It's a huge initiative of MOES and uh, thank uh, from the Indian government. They have recognized the importance of deposition mission. They have approved it. It's a 4,070 crore or so. And uh, so this will be basically to understand deposition science, deposition biology, deep, deep sea observation, deep sea geophysical studies and understanding. And they, we have six components in the deposition mission. One is the development of technologies for deep sea mining, which I talked about polymetallic nodules and hydrothermal sulfide, underwater vehicle, technological innovations for exploring and observation of deep sea biodiversity. We, we don't understand deep sea biodiversity. We don't understand anything. And we need to really understand our biodiversity in the ocean is much more than land biodiversity. So we need to really understand the deep sea biodiversity, ocean survey, which I talk about e set survey and exploration. So hydrothermal sulfide uh, exploration and survey will be the part of that. Advanced marine station ocean biology. We, we don't have much understanding about ocean biology. We need to really understand. And there are two small projects, uh, not small, but it's a kind of pilot studies on uh, energy and freshwater, another is development of ocean climate change and basic surveys, which invoice will be doing it. And uh, under this, we are planning uh, manned submersible. It's a, it's a huge uh, uh, project, which uh, ambitious, very ambitious, huge, but very ambitious project which MIS has done recently under the monsoon mission is the development of mass submersible in which three people can sit and go down. It's almost like a spacecraft which goes up with the people. So ISRO is uh, trying to send people outside space. So MOS is trying to send people down up 6,000 meters. And uh, so ISRO is helping us in terms of uh, some technology development. But it's the main work is done by scientists at NIOT. And a lot of progress has achieved. And I'm very sure the next two to three years, at least, at least by three years, we'll have a sample of uh, Man submersible, which uh, people can use it to go down. It's a prestigious issue, and it has a whole definitely just uh, plenty of applications. Only I understand only five countries have this man submersible so far. 
the idea will be the sixth country if we really develop. I am very sure we will develop, and when we develop, it will be India will be the sixth country to develop this kind of space. It's a huge price card. Uh, the people already name it as uh, Matsya 6000. Another is, I said, though, hydrothermal sulfate. This is also a very ambitious program under our deep ocean mission. We need to really understand, explore the hydrothermal sulfate the sites, which is, as I said, it's a very difficult job. There's no direct observation. Indirectly, we should do that. And there are plenty of uh, challenges are there. And uh, for this, we, we also will be, uh, IMOS also will be procuring a research vessel for doing this work. And also, India has come out of the blue economy. Blue economy concept has been not very popular in this country. And very recently, India blue economy concept has come. Uh, so blue economy is nothing but uh, the contribution of economy from the oceans. And uh, but the importance of blue economy is uh, contribution of ocean resources, but but preserving the ocean sustainability, the preserving the health of the oceans. You cannot um, uh, take out the resources by harming the ocean. So that is the most uh, important uh, difference from. Um, uh, blue economy from so-called gray economy or green economy or uh, white economy. Uh, so blue economy has a special. So we have developed a kind of a policy document, which is, um, I'm not sure it has been approved, but it is under ready for approval. And once that is done, MOS will lead the initiatives of blue economy working closely with other relevant ministries like Ministry of Shipping, Ministry of Fisheries and Environment Forest, Ministry of uh, uh, Energy, et cetera. And I will come I'm coming to the really last uh, five, uh, five, six slides only. Now, polar research also, why polar is uh, important. Uh, I hope I have time another five, 10 minutes. I hope I will be continuing for another five, 10 minutes. So, polar research, why polar uh, region is important because uh, polar regions are important in many ways. Uh, it's a part of the system, that's number one. Number two is uh, polar uh, region is important in terms of climate. And uh, because it has a lot of snow and uh, sea ice. And it has an um, uh, important role in understanding, sorry, the balance in the Earth's energy. So Earth energy balance or uh, radiative balance, uh, polar regions are very important. And studies have shown that both Arctic and Antarctic has a lot of influence on Indian region, Indian monsoon. And also we need to really understand how the polar regions work. We can have many clues for our day-to-day -day life. So we need to really work on both the polar regions. And we have a third port now, Himalayas, and Himalayas is also very important for India. So we need to really understand Himalayas. So we have research on both the all three uh, polar regions. And Antarctica, of course, Antarctica, uh, as all of us know that the old years, I don't know how many years, 50 or 50 million years back, India was part of Antarctica. We came out from Antarctica. And um, that's what uh, observations and studies are showing. And so we have a lot of attachment to Antarctica. So Department of Ocean Development has set up the first uh, observatory called Dashina Gangotri. Now it has been buried under sea ice now, 83. And after 88, uh, they have set up another station called Maitri. It's nearby, very nearby. But a little far away now, we have the third station called Bharati. It is set up in 86. So we have now two stations where we send people every year um, uh, expeditions. And we do a lot of research on uh, so one is understanding, for example, uh, Oasis Japan, uh, with the uh, Japan uh, group. We are trying to understand the coring, uh, coring expression to understand uh, to understand the reconstruction of the CA's variability. So you make um, drill drill the hole and um, take it out and uh, go to the lab and taking observations and analysis the scores. We can understand how the CA's variability is changing. Our um, so these key ice scores are very important. Of uh, it's all proxies for uh, understanding our old climate. Value climb. So we need to really understand. So as all of us know that carbon dioxide measurements were done earlier uh, in Antarctica from the ice cores. And uh, because carbon dioxide molecules are trapped in the ice cores there, and they found that when it about 10,000 years back, what was the carbon dioxide level? So this, this kind of understanding is very important. So we have, we have been doing a lot of work on this. And another is, um, uh, so uh, Antarctica, a lot of landless uh, expeditions have been done. This is the 40th and this is going on now. Expeditions and they have done a lot of experiment called, uh, recently they done a experiment called Maddie's uh, with India and Norway and three seasons they have done and they have polar net observation they launched they have a lot of observation on sonic project they project with Japan and biogeochemistry they are doing it and Arctic lacks a reconstruction of past record ice core sediment core and CS variability they have been doing it they have in future they have of course uh, expeditions will continue they are 
They have a plan of 500 meter ice core in collaboration with the UK and Norway, which will be very, very interesting. And also they are going to work on geological exploration of uh, Amiri ice cells, sea ice variability, mapping of glacier and thickness, and of course, understand the connections between Antarctica and uh, tropical regions. Uh, similarly, Arctic also is very important. Arctic, we have launched very recently, uh, launched the program in recent 2008 or so. And uh, we have set up an observatory called Himadri there. And about 200 internal researchers go there every year, but we go only during summer season because winter it will be too hostile to leave there. But still, some people leave, but um, uh, may be planning for winter expeditions also a little later. And the station managed for more than 180 days a year, and more than 100 publications have come from Arctic. Arctic also is very important, like Antarctic, for the country. And it has a lot of application, especially for Indian monsoon. A lot of research papers are coming out. Arctic uh, is very, Arctic climate is very important for Indian monsoon, as well as extreme weather events over India. And this is the task uh, accomplished um, um, 11 expeditions so far and uh, 20 to 25 projects per year. And it's not only MOS institution only participating. We, there are a lot of institutions uh, um, in the country, they participate in university students, they go. And also, they have an ambitious future plan in the coming years. The another is the Himalaya, third port Himalaya. Yes, they also, there also, they set up an observatory called Himans. I remember I going there and inaugurating this Himan station at the 4,500 meter above sea level, and it is in Lahul Spiti area. And uh, there, the basic understand the basic objective is to understand the glacier dynamics of the Himalaya. And as all of us know that with the global warming, uh, glaciers are melting. So we need to really understand how these things are happening. So this is all very ambitious project uh, which uh, uh, NCPU or Goa is doing it. And Himalaya, these are the future plans there. So we need to really understand the thickness of the glacier. Glacier area can be measured using satellites or other things, but the thickness is very important. So you need a lot of aircraft observations, which it's PR is going to plan. And also the globe, the globe, the glacier lake, outburst lake, uh, that is very important um, uh, phenomena which is happening in this region. So we need to really understand this. So this kind of study is also being taken up uh, by NCPR in the Himalayan region the coming year. And also, they have an ambitious program for going to Southern Ocean to understand the dynamics of Southern Ocean and how it uh, participates in the global climate as well as India, India's uh, climate patterns. I'll, uh, this is the last portion. Is, uh, my last is earthquake um, um, monitoring as well as uh, um, giving information to the people. Under the seismic services, earthquake monitoring and information services 24-7 is the important activity. So as all of us know that we cannot predict the earthquake, we don't do prediction, but we do the monitoring and uh, information services. And we also done a lot of work on seismic metro sonation work and earthquake uh, hazard assessment report. Uh, we have been preparing it. And they also trying to understand earthquake precursors, whether it can we really get some kind of precursors for earthquake before earthquake happens. So that that can be used for understanding uh, and also the data developing earthquake uh, prediction model. And uh, recently we launched, uh, not very recently, about five years, five, six years back, deep borehole investigation in Koina and our region to understand. I will just briefly mention, so earlier, uh, 1898 was first uh, observatory set up in Alipur, Calcutta, after the 1890s and Shillong get Then in 1947, we had only five observatories, and that slowly moved. These are all analog and manual observatories, up to 1845 observatories are there. 2001, 62, and they started doing digital. And when I joined as a secretary, it was 84 observatories. Now, uh, when I retired, it was almost 150, almost doubled it. And um, so these are all digital and online, and uh, these observations are available on online. And these observations are used for understanding the, and uh, the locating the earthquakes and informing the government as well as the concerned authorities in real time. And they have a plans for improving into another 500 or so in the coming years. And this is the network, the small screen network, and a huge network. And this way, most of the observatories, observatories are very close to Himalayas, where it's, it's really earthquake prone region. And also, we do a cycle of my SSB micro sonation. We know the larger, broader region where earthquakes happen, and we have classified it to different levels one, two, three, two, three, four, et cetera. And, uh, but uh, over particular cities, we need to really understand how the um, how this uh, uh, threat is happening. So for some build up, there's such kind of microsonation work we have completed for uh, cities like Delhi, Bangalore, Calcutta, et cetera. And uh, recently, we launched, a few years back, we launched for four cities, Delhi, Chennai, Coimbatore, and Bhubaneswar. 
I know eight cities uh, we have taken up the work, uh, which is very close to Himalayas, Padna, Meerut. So also this, this kind of um, data will be very useful to for town planning, especially for city planning, by making buildings, making school, making bridges, etc. So this such kind of studies also have been taken up by the ministry. And uh, one is this Koina project, which a uh, seismic zone project, which I said that launched about a few years back. We already made a three kilometer deep pilot hole, bore hole in Koina. It was a few, it was a costly experiment, but it's very useful. And now there are a lot of observations, observ observ instruments will be put there, taking observations, etc. This is the first time that we had a very, we could launch a very big three kilometer deep hole, bore hole, and uh, and uh, the. This is a pilot hole, but the main hole will be almost five, five to seven kilometer hole, and that will come out in another two, three years. And uh, a very important announcement which I want to make, especially with the PRL, of course, there are a lot of people studying there uh, using this kind of instruments. This is also uh, MOS is funding a UAC in Delhi for understanding understanding the geochronology and. Um, uh, 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 and this this experiment, uh, this this collaboration is going on for last uh, for four years, and there are a lot of small hiccups everywhere every time. And we have already funded to by a lot of instruments, it's about 172 crore project, and uh, only one instrument is now remaining is the oscillo oscillated mass spectrometer AMS for medium and heavy ion. I think that will be a first of its kind in India, and uh, they have uh, almost finalized the details of this instrument, but. Unfortunately, this um, we are not able to. They are not able to buy this instrument because now the uh, important issue has come out to the building because you need a special kind of building. And where IUAC is kept uh, is there, and they are not going. The Delhi government is not allowing them to make any construction there. So we have been uh, talking to them for the last one and a half years. So I said, uh, I said that we cannot buy this instrument unless the building is ready. Otherwise, the instrument will come and lie there, and uh, the building will not be available. So now we have planned of moving everything to Noida. We are Noida, we got about 50 acre land from Noida, uh, Uttar Pradesh government. So we'll be soon making a building there in Noida and uh, this instrument will be purchased. And by that, uh, by that we will complete all the uh, projects of all the e equipments related to National Geochronology Facility. And uh, these are the instruments which are already procured, and I'm very sure the geoscience community will be making use of this facility. It's a national facility, anybody can uh, come and use. And uh, so these are the last, uh, last, uh, last uh, slide. Uh, yes, science. Uh, we really see the investments made in uh, uh, science, um, Ministry of Sciences, uh, which uh, cost us so each Indian film divided by the total population of India. It costs about 10, 10 rupees per, per per year, not even a cost of a Pepsi or Coke. And uh, but you can understand what is the economic benefits and how many people are being saved by investing money. So government is uh, becoming more and more aware about the investments in science, science, uh, science, the system science, and they need to really put more and more investments so that we can bring in more economic benefits for the country, and also we can save more and more people. Tropical cyclone is the best example, and, but then we need to really do it for heavy rain, for flash floods, thunderstorms, lightning, heat waves, etc. So this effort should continue. I am very sure that uh, government will really keep supporting I mean, share sciences, and we'll be doing a whole system science community will work together, and we'll be bringing a lot of new achievements for the country. With this, I will stop here. And once again, uh, Dr. Anil Bardwa, thank you very much for inviting me. I think I really enjoyed uh, talking this. Have this important subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajivan, for this uh, fascinating, you know, illuminating and informative talk. It's been a very comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, essay of uh, uh, various, you know, advancements made in the earth uh, system science in the country. Uh, Maybe you know, atmospheres, uh, you know, rainfall. Uh, or oceans, rivers, uh, polar research, Himalayan research, you know, explorations in deep sea, blue economy, uh, or, uh, or, or also the, even the policy issues like continental you know, shelf. It's been you know, really a lot of uh, information packed in your uh, one hour of talk. It's, it's really amazing. I am sure each and every one of your slide is a one hour talk. I can see that and then you have really uh, you know, uh, thank you for putting us, you know, succinctly various aspects 
and uh, I'm sure uh, there are, uh, I think, very beneficial for all of us and all the audience who are listening to this talk, both in WebEx and YouTube. And uh, I'm sure there will be some, you know, several questions in this uh, for to you also in this, uh, you know, in, for in the next few minutes. And uh, I will now request, uh, you know, Dr. Lokesh uh, Sahu to conduct the question answers. You know, he'll be uh, looking at the questions both in the YouTube and the WebEx, and maybe you know, uh, speaking speaking out loud to you so that you can answer those questions. Thank you once again, Dr. Rajiv. Yes, Dr. Lokesh. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very nice and uh, comprehensive presentation, Vakyan, covering various aspects on our system science. Um, now it's time to interact with our viewers uh, who have joined through the YouTube and uh, WebEx. So what I'll do is that I'll first uh, read the questions which is posted in uh, YouTube chat box one by one. And then after that, we'll interact with our colleagues who have joined through the WebEx. So I'll start with the first question, which is by Professor Devesh Sinha. His question is, are the predictive models for the Indian monsoon refined every year based on unexpected rains like the one happening now? Well, um, uh, the, the improvement in the models are, is being, it's a continuous process. Every, every time we'll be improving the models. And uh, it's not uh, um, specific, the improvement will not be specific to a particular event. And uh, because many events can happen in a particular year. year. So we'll be, uh, MOS institution will be keep on doing this improvement. And uh, such kind of uh, extreme weather events can be predicted in the coming features, future. And uh, that's what our expectation. So this improvement in the model is a continuous process, a never ending process in terms of improving physics, in terms of improving data, Improving data simulation methods and improving post processing methods, etc. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, we have another, another question from UP Verma. This question is uh, What sort of modeling and parametric variation related investigations are undertaken for monitoring of tsunamis and earthquakes? Uh, tsunamis, I said that, that uh, they need observations about earthquakes occurring um, uh, around India. So they have um, a tsunami buoy, data buoys in the Bay of Bengal, about five buoys and two buoys, I think, in over the Arabian Sea. And they also get a lot of data on earthquakes happening everywhere, uh, anywhere in the part of the world. So they, um, uh, they monitor it and they put it in this observation into the model and they, they try to mimic that. Uh, earthquake process and try to understand whether a tsunami is possible or not. And if tsunami is possible, of course, they'll give alert. And if it's not possible, they give a kind of no alert, no alert kind of thing. So they have both observations and also they have a wide, wide, big, big wide, ne wide network. And also they have a, a best of best models. And uh, the tsunami boys in uh, Bay of Bengal will give you a kind of information when really a tsunami occurs in the east of uh, tsunami uh, Bay of Bengal, somewhere in Indonesia, etc. Tsunami wave comes and this voice will detect it very quickly and uh, it can be immediately transferred to a kind of a alert to the people. So, and two are there the, in the North Arabian Sea for basically for earthquakes occurring in the Arakan coast. Thank you, sir. And the uh, uh, follow up question is like uh, the implications of AI and ML. AI, I think, artificial intelligence and ML is machine learning, I think in the warning of the uh, disaster can be helpful. So he's asking whether these AI and ML can be used to predict. Of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, AML is a very powerful tool and uh, my ministry has already recognized that already we have, we have set up a virtual uh, center at IATM Pune for AML, uh, which uh, the team will be working on AML application on weather and climate and not only on weather and climate, uh, both on ocean as well as even uh, seismology. And also, we have uh, recently um, uh, completed the, the procedure for process for uh, giving projects to eight projects. We added about 120 projects or so proposals. We added about eight projects on AML from different universities and academic institutions. And they'll be working closely with us to develop uh, different tools based on AML techniques. So we, we appreciate the, uh, we acknowledge the importance of AML. Are, it is going to be a very powerful tool in the coming years. Thank you, sir. And uh, we have another set of questions from Professor Devesh Sinha. 
This question is the sea level rise curve so for global and reserves for Indian region. They saw the steep, you know, rise from the LGM. Okay, where there was not many human influences. So his question is: Can the anthropogenic contribution be filtered? Uh, I, well, I, can you repeat this question? What is the question exactly? His question is that the the sea level rise, okay, shows very steep changes after LGM from LGM. What is this LGM? Uh, I think it is last uh, global maximum or something like that. Last, LGM. last glacial maxima. LGM yeah, is last, last glacial maxima. Uh, yeah. Last glacial. Okay. So, so from that period, it shows very steep rise. Okay. So his question is that can the anthropogenic contribution be filtered in that? Yeah, sure, sure. I think I have more. So whatever we have observed for last uh, 30, 30, 35 years is mainly contributed by human activity. Uh, nothing else can be, of course, either that could be natural variability, and uh, but most of the commonality is mainly because of the global warming, sea level rise, and it's very much uh, it can be filtered out, and it can be it is all I, I remember it, it is already filtered out. People know how much is the contribution from anthropogenic effect. Okay, thank you, sir. Another question is another question is is MOES planning more dis desalinization plants like one developed by NIOT in Lakshadweep? Or other yeah. coastal cities. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, important question. So I uh, see this technology which they use uh, in uh, Lakshadweep is indigenous technology. As I thought they use the thermal gradient between the top of the ocean and uh, bottom, uh, sorry, maybe 100, 100, 200 meter down. And, uh, and the temperature gradient should be around 13 to 14 degrees Celsius. And uh, that is uh, easily available in um, uh, nearby the Lakshadweep Island. But Lakshadweep Islands are just fillets. If you go a little away from the island, then the sea, sea is very deep. And uh, so even if you go 150, 200 meters away, you can get this temperature gradient. You can get. But over the Indian coast, say, for example, if you want to do it in Chennai, you need, for 13 degree, you need to really go up to 50 kilometers away. Okay, it's because the slope is very small slope. It doesn't go very deep immediately. Unless, um, let's say the balance is just two pillars. Uh, even if you go a little away, the, the sea depth will be very high. And uh, so the same technology can be done, but we need to really go very far. And so this, this technology is very suitable for such kind of islands. For main island, it can be used, but then it will be very expensive. So, but uh, MOS also has a plan for doing such kind of experiment for Chennai. That's why in the under monsoon mission, one of the project is to design such kind of experiment and uh, do some kind of pilot studies for a Chennai, Chennai coast. So we made an estimate for such kind of plan for Chennai about 10 million uh, liter water. And uh, so from thermal gradient, you can generate electricity and electricity can be, same electricity can be used to uh, run a desalination plant. And then once you make the desalination plant, then you have to bring the water back to 50 kilometer to the coast. So it's all huge investment. You need to put a lot of big tubes and pipes and all. So we estimated it would cost about 2,500 crores. So a huge cost. So uh, instead of investing immediately for that cost, we thought first we will do some kind of experiments and do some balance studies, then if you're really feasible, we will uh, go for that kind of investment. But it is possible, but it's a tough job. Yeah. So uh, we have a question from uh, Saket Singh. It's kind of curious, curious question. This question is, how do we share our real-time data with other global agencies like USGS or NOAA, and what we get in return? Well, uh, see, well, USGS is uh, um, they are worried about seismological data, and the seismological data, unfortunately, we don't share much data with others. I think uh, there's an international understanding, and also we have national security issues, so we don't share all seismological real time seismological data real time with anyone except a few data. I don't remember how many. I think three or four, not more, with the USGS, and uh, mainly because of security reasons. I cannot explain those uh, issues here. Uh, but whereas uh, weather data, weather and uh, atmospheric data, or ocean data, it's a uh, free of cost. We simply we have a, a global telecommunication network. Uh, all meta offices are connected, and through the network is called G GTS, Global Telecommunication System. Through the GTS, it goes to all the countries, and our their data also is, comes to us. Uh, uh, for example, as uh, we take observations every three hours, uh, starting from zero UTC, for example, 5:30 in the morning. So by that observation, by 8.30, 9 o'clock, we get most of the global data here. Thank you, sir. And uh, we have a question from Prabhakar Sarma. His question is, how would the global warming affect 
the monsoon, particularly its predictability? Uh, that's a, a very interesting question. So we know qualitatively that global warming, warming is uh, happening and that is going to affect the Indian monsoon. Uh, we have uh, understanding that it can affect the, uh, so what the climate models are suggesting that uh, the monsoon rainfall, the quantum of rainfall may not be changing much. Uh, maybe a slight increase can be expected, but the characteristics of uh, monsoon rainfall will change. I mean to say that daily rainfall for example. So we may be experiencing experience more and more uh, very heavy rains in a day. Extreme rainfall events will be increasing more and number of dry spells will be increasing more. These are the two things which we can expect. But the quantum of rainfall may may not change much. And the variability also can change. Every year, you may one year you may get a very highly flooded year, another year you may get a drought. So the variability may also may change. These are the two, three things which are we are very sure about uh, global impact of global warming in the power months. Okay, thank you, sir. And there is a one question from Bharat Boba. It is from YouTube only. This question is urban flooding is becoming a major issue with high intensity frequency rainfall in urban areas. I uh, wish to have your suggestion regarding this. Yeah, so we appreciate that. Uh, we understand that all the coastal cities are vulnerable for uh, coastal flooding. The flooding can happen with the local uh, rainfall, like uh, Chennai, it happened like that. And uh, Bombay rain, for example, local rains, uh, 2005 or so. And uh, But it can also happen because of the storm surge, because of the sea level rise, because of the tides. So if you, if, if everything comes together, Chennai, it, it has come everything together. There was a cyclone approaching, there was a high tide, uh, then local rain you put together, you'll get plenty of... So this fl uh, the coastal flooding is an important event. That's why we started working on coastal flooding <coughs> forecasting system for Chennai as well as Bombay. So now we'll be moving on to Calcutta and other regions now. <laughs> but it is very important. Uh, Agenda for initiatives. Okay. Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Thank Dr. you. Go to the next question. Uh, Dr. Rajan, uh, sorry, may I request you to unshare your uh, your slides? Probably what I'm, what we are seeing you, we are not able to see you in full mode. You uh -huh. can unshare so your unshare, Again, unshare, I have to struggle. <laughs> unshare, yeah, now, now you can see your screen, yes. Yeah, that now you have removed the, yeah, yeah, it's done now. I am I am also very relieved. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. okay. Thank, thank you, you, sir, for uh, um, answering questions posted in uh, YouTube. Now it's time that um, our viewers who have joined through Webex can interact directly with you. And uh, I request our colleagues to have uh, interaction with um, uh, Dr. Rajivan. So we have uh, from Professor Despande. So please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rajivan, thank you very much for such a nice uh, talk and comprehensive talk. Really learned many things. I have a couple of questions. The first question is that this uh, monsoon mission coupled uh, monsoon forecast, you mentioned that it was phase one and phase two. Until 2017, it was phase one, and then uh, 18 to 21, phase two. So, will you please uh, enlighten us that what is the basic difference between the phase one and phase two? Yeah, the phase one we developed the basic uh, infrastructure for uh, uh, for uh, weather and uh, climate forecast. So, we established all the modeling forecasting systems. We could buy the computer and we could do the first first kind of experiments and we fine tune the models. And the second phase was most of our applications, for example, developing application tools for agriculture, developing application for uh, for water resources, etc., and help to some extent health. And uh, second phase also, we uh, once established the system, we need to further improve the models, isn't it? So second phase also, we try to improve the models. And the third phase also will be something like this. So we will be we have to keep on improving the models and also developing more applications. So third phase will be developing again more application. Third phase will be more emphasizing on AI and ML techniques for improving the models. Okay. And this uh, percentage departure from the forecast, is that one of the criteria of deciding that our uh, model is, you know, moving in the desired direction uh, or how do we... For, uh, for uh, testing a model, whether it's good or not, we have a lot of the different skill scores. Uh, statistical skill scores we use many there are plenty there are plenty uh, so there are common methods like root mean c square error correlations and bias score uh, 
there are plenty of uh, kids case score there are so many scores so we use uh, commonly we use and wmo the world meteorological organization has prescribed some common verification scores which normally be used because that can be uh, if you use it then it can be compared with other countries what they are doing so we should use the common verification scores uh, i have one more question that in last 3 years if we uh, just see the behavior of monsoon then uh, in 19 uh, 2019 it was uh, 15% excess compared to the forecast then uh, in 2020 it was plus 9% excess and this year also it was quite disturbing because we thought that by 13th of uh, june the monsoon will come and then at least in the northern india but somehow it came in mid july or so so are they related to the cyclones which occurred uh, in that those years Uh, very difficult to say. Uh, well, this kind uh, of variabilities are inbuilt in the monsoon season, so it's uh, very, difficult to, very difficult to say that uh, we cannot attribute to one particular event uh, why uh, this is happening. So, okay. and uh, yeah, that's very difficult to say. Right. So it may be a chance coincidence that uh, this year this Tauke and the Yas came. Then last year there was uh, Nisar and Amphan. They all came in the beginning of the monsoon itself. Before that, Vayu also came. so this is also something systematically happening or it is just random according to you i am not sure let us see next year whether it is happening or not <laughs> okay. i am not sure it could be it could be see the 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 purpose, the, the the meaning is both arabian sea and bay bengal is getting more and more warm and uh, early arabian sea was uh, very sub, uh, subdued and uh, because temperatures are very small only once in a while it happens but every year now the arabian sea is warm is here for cyclone to form you need a threshold of sst for 27 degree or so and plus other other conditions so now arabian sea is always more than 27 yeah uh, even in uh, april may itself so that is a really dangerous thing so we can we should uh, next next year next year also two 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 systems can really form mm. i am not ruling i am not ruling out mm. thank you thank you very much Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Yeah. Now I request our director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, to interact with the uh, with Dr. Rajivan. Thank you, Lokesh, and uh, thanks to Dr. Rajivan for an excellent talk, uh, or I should say, backhand. I have a couple of questions. The first one, which I am looking for, is uh, you mentioned about seeding of clouds, you know, and uh, there were experiments being conducted uh, uh, by MOES on that. so what is the success rate of uh, artificial rains through seeding well uh, that is a question which i am also asking them and the white paper i hear they are not completed the white paper i am very curious to know but that is the that is the message that's a number which we have to give to the government so if uh-huh. you do 100 experiments out of 100 it's when 40 experiments or 30 experiments will be successful so uh-huh. what i have I, i was told is that there is a benefit definitely there is a benefit of doing cloud seeding but whether it, that benefit is proportional to the investments made we have spent 200 crore so um, it's a huge cost because you need to really bring aircraft and you need to spend a lot of time is it really worth of doing it and the government will do only to make sure that water water availability you know there will be stress water stress so we need to bring uh, water from the clouds to take care of the drinking water or to uh, save the agriculture crops whether such kind of rains uh, cloud seeding will really help to do these things that is more important so frankly speaking that once the report is available i think uh, we will get the number uh, i am also very curious to know but what i was told that there is a benefit but whether it is proportional whether it is really economically viable is a important question which we need to ask i see the link to this is the question that uh, when we do really seeding is it the region where we do seeding uh, we expect the rain or it, it there is a transport happening and then the rainfall happens at some other place yeah but it doesn't happen where exactly where the seeding is happening because it can uh, clouds can really start moving keep moving so but it may not be very far away you maybe few 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 kilometers away uh, but not exactly maybe it could be even within the district or near nearby district but it cannot go away very far from other to another state or so the cloud lifetime is maximum about 2 3 2 hours maximum right uh my next question is a little bit of uh, economics uh, because you mentioned about blue economy and uh, uh india is certainly uh, getting a good advantage of this 
harping or uh, taking the advantage of uh, you know ocean surrounding india uh, do you have any estimate of how much is the blue economy contribution to total economy yeah we are made we are made uh, because nidhi aayog has set up many committees the first committee was to understand the definition and making a definition and uh, estimate so i was the chairman for that committee and we estimated it's a rough estimate uh, we involved uh, nidhi aayog people we involved um, uh, people from rias we involved the people from ministry of statistics and uh, planning so which the, the, who are the people who make all gdp gdp details and gdp estimation and all so our estimation is 4% percentage of indian gdp is contributed by blue economy this what we may we may say it's a little conservative estimate it could be even 5 to 6 nice that is the order 4 to 4 to 6 that's a good, that's a good number actually it's a good number it's a good number yes. Yes. yes okay my last question is with respect to monsoon and you are a monsoon expert so <laughs> Uh, how well we are now with respect to you know predicting monsoon both in terms of uh, onset and in terms of amount of rain see the onset is good uh, for example when we monsoon comes over kerala we are able to stay at least some 3 4 days before even sometimes even 10 days before even 15 days before onset is pretty good see we, the models are good in saying that whether it will rain or not so okay so onset is very easy to say but the quantum is a, a difficult job for example when we say that amlavar on uh, after two days it will rain 10 mm 10 cm per summer it may not be 10 cm it could be 5 cm it could be 15 cm the quantum of it's called quantitative precipitation forecast qpf we call and that qpf is used for flood warning because flood warning to understand how much flood will occur you, they need a amount they simply say it will rain they will not be able to do anything you have to give how much rain will occur in the river basin so that's all quantitative that is a very very tough job not only in india any any part of the world quantitative precipitation forecast are very tough so that's why we normally go for uh, beyond, up to two days may be possible but beyond two days very difficult job so that's why we go for a probabilistic forecast so you may say it may uh, it may not be 22 cm but it may say it, it may exceed 20, this high probability it may exceed 15 cm such kind of probability forecast but quantitative precipitation forecast i should confess it's a really challenging job but this extreme weather events are on increase you know in the last uh, couple of years uh, or maybe a decade so is that linked to certain phenomena or is it still a random process uh, it is systematic it's not random it's systematic and it is uh, it is mostly attributed to global warming there's no doubt about it extreme weather events are mostly attributed to global warming. of course natural variability also may be playing a role but it's very difficult to differentiate between these two but global warming has a role and we can uh, and it's not random it's systematically occurring okay thank you thank think, you sir uh, i think Ra- raju yeah. has a question he's yeah. raising yeah 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 professor raju yes please go ahead and interact yeah. yeah. yes uh, yeah thank you i think i had a question regarding as a signatory to the antarctic treaty uh, india i understand that has a uh, has a uh, what do you say um, a role or or or, or uh, claim on certain land beyond the ocean beyond the boundaries and uh, now what you were telling is about the uh, about the commission on continental shelf you know claiming some more space so this is different than that i suppose well, i go, i could not understand what do initially what you told uh, as a signatory to the to the international antarctic treaty Uh, Antarctica Treaty is different. Antarctica Treaty is different. Antarctica Treaty is only for men for Antarctica, and this uh, this is different. This is entirely different. This is to just to get the uh, continental shelf uh, claim for uh, nearby Indian mainland. So both are different. We have so we are a signatory in the Antarctica Treaty, and uh, which uh, caters to Antarctica activities. This is entirely different commission. This is under UN. But uh, but that's uh, that that treaty itself. I, uh, it was my understanding that. Uh, you know, around the Indian continental boundary, you know, some certain region will be ours. Okay, uh, what? So this, that is, I don't know the numbers of how how many kilometers beyond the boundary will be treated as you know Indian uh, uh, waters or Indian zone. And that's why you know uh, I was. But we have, that... 
I am not. I am not sure whether under Antarctica Treaty we have that kind of provision. I am not sure, but we have the so-called E set, economically ex exclusive zone. That is about two hundred nautical miles. Okay. So that is a, that 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 under E set, there is nobody else has a claim. It's only exclusively for India. In the continental shelf, we have claim. If we really get that claim successful, we have claim only for the sea bottom. But top of the ocean, anybody can come and do anything. Okay. But under the water, uh, seabed, nobody else can uh, do anything. Only India is allowed to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very, you know, uh, very interesting, uh, fascinating aspect. Which yeah, but it is a really a politically politically connected uh, okay. issue. It's a really a, a very complicated issue. Yes. Uh, other countries are also getting involved. So. Thank you. Thank you very so, much. I, I invite other colleagues, if they would like to interact, we can take one or two questions. If they have any. So, yeah, uh, so thank you, sir. And uh, we have uh, come to the close of uh, interaction sections. And I once again, thank you for giving your valuable time interacting with our viewers. And now I hand over the session to Professor Raju for further proceedings. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. No, uh, Durga Prasad uh, is there who want, uh, want will formally you know, uh, bring a convergence closer to this yeah, camp. Durga Prasad, please. So uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Palam Raju for giving me this opportunity to deliver out of thanks. Uh, good evening, sir. And on behalf of the entire PRL family, and in particular, PRL Kamrut Vyakyan Committee, I thank Dr. M. Rajivan for accepting our invitation and delivering the 12th Vyakyan of our 75 episode PRL Kamrut Vyakyan series on a very important topic of earth system science and its socioeconomic benefits. So I think that he has covered the entire uh, uh, Panchabhut, which directly connects to our day-to-day -day activity and its implications. Thank you very much, sir, for your informative, wonderful, and amazing Vakyan and patiently answering all the query of our viewers. I thank our director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, for his continued support and encouragement for making this Vakyan series going on. I thank Professor Palam Raju, Dean PRL, for his nice introduction of our today's Vyakhyan Karta, Dr. Rajivan. I thank Professor Nandita Chair and Dr. Lokesh Co-Chair and all the members of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan Committee and all others behind for their efforts. Most importantly, I, a lot of thanks to all our participants and viewers who have joined us live through Webex and YouTube today for this Vyakhyan. With this, we come to the end of this wonderful episode. Now we sign off from PRL, but stay tuned Keep following us and see you all next week with an, another new and interesting Vakyan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Oba. Thank you, Anna, Dr. Al Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Bye.